Welcome to Introduction to Robotics. Uh, this is the first live event for the, the second running of the Introduction to Robotics MOOC from QUT. And my name is Peter Cork. Uh, we've got a number of questions on notice, so we're going to, uh, to work through those shortly. And uh, there's some, some really good questions there, so I can uh, let fly with some, some opinions or, or thoughts uh, about, those, about those questions. So if you've just signed up, please, uh, please feel free to, to send some questions in and uh, we'll, we'll get to them. Uh, this will last for a maximum of, of one hour. Uh, I'm broadcasting from a different location to, to previously. Uh, right now I'm in Oxford in, in the UK. I'm on uh, sabbatical leave from Queensland University of Technology. I've come to Oxford to hang out with uh, the Mobile Robotics Group. Uh, it's a pretty awesome group doing some amazing work in mobile robotics. So in particular, self-driving self -driving cars use a number of different sensing modalities. They use um, laser scanners and they use cameras in order to localize the car, that is to figure out whereabouts it is within a road network and, and control it. So uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty impressive group. I visited them a number of times before and uh, they're doing some really, really nice work in autonomous driving, which is a really uh, hot topic in robotics at the moment. Uh, Google have got a lot of a lot of press, a lot of notoriety for their work in self-driving cars, uh, but they're certainly not the only group on the planet uh, that are working on self-driving cars. So most of the automotive manufacturers have got their own internal research programs, uh, Daimler, uh, Mercedes, Audi, uh, Nissan, uh, and, and so on. They all have in-house programs trying to develop autonomy. And then there's a number of other, uh, if you like, more mainstream computer companies also trying to do the self-driving car thing. So Google, as I mentioned before, uh, Apple we know about, and a bunch of other startup companies. So it's probably going to be the next big uh, growth area in, in robotics is bringing autonomy to cars. And lots of advantages of doing that. Uh, one is that Potentially, we can reduce the number of uh, road accidents and fatalities. Um, motor vehicle accidents kill around a million people on the planet every year, uh, and most of those are due to human error. So hopefully, robotic cars could dramatically reduce the fatality rate due to uh, due to people uh, driving driving their cars and driving them badly. The other thing I think that's a real advantage of autonomous cars is dealing with traffic problems. The main reason the traffic flows so slowly on uh, on roads is because humans are not, again, not particularly good drivers. So you have interesting dynamic between the reaction times of lots of humans driving cars in a queue and the result is that you get this kind of stop-start motion. You get waves of cars uh, as, they, as they move down roads. It's very inefficient. It means we can't get as many cars along a road as we possibly could. So again, self-driving cars should be able to keep cars moving with very small spacing in between the vehicles uh, and moving at a more uniform velocity. So another advantage of autonomy, uh, first advantage is safety. Second advantage is that we should be able to push more cars uh, down roads. So we don't have to spend money and build uh, wider roads, uh, bigger freeways. We just make the cars smarter and we get a lot more through. The third one is probably just due to the huge amount of human time that is wasted uh, in commutes. People sitting in their cars going almost nowhere, but they can't do anything else because they've got to drive the car. So if you have an autonomous car and you're doing a commute to work uh, and your car is autonomous, then maybe the commute's going to be quicker because of this traffic dynamic problem I mentioned before. Uh, but the other advantage is that you don't have to have your hands on the steering wheel. Uh, you could kick back and you could read the newspaper, you could answer email, talk on the phone uh, uh, without having to pay attention to the road. So these are all advantages, I think, of autonomous cars and technology that's coming. Lots of people working on it and the guys here at Oxford who I'm visiting are part of that. The other reason that I'm in Oxford, and this is kind of a longish introduction, is that it is time for me to do a second edition of my book. Uh, I wrote a, the book mostly 2009, 2010. Uh, it's done really well. Lots of people use it. Lots of people like it, which I'm very happy about. Uh, but there's a number of things that I think uh, are missing, things that I'd like to have put in the book the first time, but I just ran out of energy. So uh, it's time now to... Uh, 
and thought about it for five years to uh, write some uh, extra material and put it in there, perhaps change the way I present some of the material within the book. And some of that's actually due to me uh, teaching it in class. When I wrote the book, I wasn't actually an academic. I was still a research scientist at a government lab. So when I became an academic, I had to teach robotics. When you have to teach something, you have to think a lot about the order of the presentation. So that got me thinking about different ways to order or present the material. And then when we prepared the MOOC, uh, that also gave me the opportunity again to think about how the material should be presented. So the learnings from teaching in the class and from teaching in the MOOC, that's kind of going to be folded back into second edition of the book. So I am doing edits. I'm up to uh, Chap I'm through to chapter six now in terms of additions to the to the book. Uh, there's only ten chapters to go. Uh, it's just a little intimidating, and uh, hopefully the book will come out in 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 press uh, in the first half of next year, probably second quarter of next year. All going well. So that's what I've been up to, uh, hanging out in Oxford and working away on my book. So, time to get to some of the questions that people have have. Have posed, and I'm going to introduce a colleague from the QT MOOC teaching team. Uh, that's Jason Shanks, and Jason is going to uh, pitch some of the, the questions that have come in, and I'll respond. Jason, hi there. Yes, uh, Peter. Well, I got a few questions from the discussion forum here. I'll uh, uh, feed, feed to you. We've also um, at the end of that got one from uh, Cameron Whiting, who uh, you might see a little trying a little experiment here. Uh, up on the yeah, screen. I see Cameron down the bottom. Hi, Cameron. I'll let him ask his question himself uh, towards the end of the week, sure. other ones that will come in first. So, uh, yes, first question that's come in today is, um, if I want to build an, uh, sorry, this is uh, from uh, Maria de las Nive Suarez Mani. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that too correctly. Um, could you tell us more about your journey that led you to working with robots? Okay, I mean, the, the, the simple answer is that uh, I answered a, a job advertisement in the newspaper. It's kind of how most people get into, into most things. Uh, my first job after I did my undergraduate course, I did electrical, studied electrical engineering at the University of Melbourne. My first job was as a research assistant in a lab uh, at that same university. It was a controls lab, so my first job was a research assistant with a professor of controls there. And uh, we did a lot of work. I did a lot of uh, software development, and the group the group there was really looking at the control system aspects, the dynamics of power grids. So this is the dynamics of generators and loads and and power lines, which is an important problem. And somewhere along the way, I think it was for an open day at the university, we wanted to have a good demonstration. So we bought a little uh, little robot. It had stepping motors. I think it had four joints. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't very big, you know. It was probably I don't know 30 centimeters on a on a side, little tiny robot. And I decided I'd make it play uh, checkers or drafts, uh, as we would as we would say in Australia. So we bought a, a checkerboard and some pieces, and I programmed the robot. Uh, I can't remember what I programmed it in. It was probably in Fortran on on a mini computer connected to the robot, and it played checkers. And we had the open day. And this is a long time ago. This is probably 1982 or 83. So most of you were probably not born then. Uh, anyway, so the little robot played checkers, and it was pretty exciting. So it got me to think a bit about think a bit about robotics. And then sometime later, there there was a an advertisement in a newspaper uh, for a position. Uh, as a research scientist uh, working in robotics, so I applied. I got the job, and that was with a uh, very large uh, government uh, lab in Australia, an organisation called CSIRO. And so I actually spent 25 years uh, at that organisation, and I left there and came to QT in 2010. So that was really my uh, my way into into CSIRO. While I was there, I probably had multiple robotics careers. Uh, I started working for them in Melbourne. And we worked in the very traditional robotics area of manufacturing. So we're looking at robots and machine tools for manufacturing. Again, this is the early 1980s. 
and every, at that time the big interest is what was called flexible manufacturing cells. So you have a, a collection of robots, machine tools, conveyor belts and vision systems and the idea was how can you quickly configure that uh, in order that it could make anything. Uh, the big issue in manufacturing is if you want to make a, a lot of items, you want to make millions of things, then you build a manufacturing system uh, that's designed that can efficiently build millions of those things. But if you only want to build thousands of those things and you don't want to employ people to do that manufacturing, people are very versatile. You tell them what to do and they'll do it. If you want to get robots uh, to be more versatile, then there's a lot of work needs to be done on how you uh, mechanically configure them and how you program them uh, quickly and efficiently uh, in order to to build the things you want in small batch sizes. That was the challenge we were looking at then. Um, so I worked on that and then I got interested in computer vision and we did a number of computer vision projects uh, in food inspection and also in traffic monitoring and traffic inspection. So we built a very early uh, traffic infringement system that monitored the speed of uh, trucks moving along highways in Australia and issued infringement notices to them if they went too quickly between point A and point B. We knew they were speeding and we would uh, ticket them. Uh, that was a really interesting project. Uh, and then I moved to Brisbane and got interested in working in robots for the mining industry. Uh, so we took very existing large uh, mining machines for uh, for open open pit mining and underground mining and added sensors and computers and turned them into robots. And then I got interested in uh, in environmental monitoring for robots and then I uh, worked on flying robots and underwater robots uh, that would go out and collect environmental data to make it more efficient, uh, more efficient, more cost effective ways of collecting environmental data. Because at the moment that's incredibly uh, labor intensive, very manual process which adds to the expense, it means we don't collect as much environmental data as we should do. Uh, and that was a really uh, interesting uh, period of work. Uh, and then I wrote a book and then I left and joined the university. And so there at the university our interests are still in environmental robotics, agricultural robotics, so how do we uh, create robots that can perform tasks uh, in agriculture. Uh, feeding all the people on the planet is going to be a really big challenge into the future. So I think agricultural robotics is important. We've started a new program in health and medical robotics I'm not directly involved in that. It's a relatively new program. But again, healthcare is a really important cost for society on the planet. Perhaps you know the biggest expenditure for any society is going into healthcare. And that's going up and up and up over time. So the can we apply some of the productivity improving ideas uh, that have come from automating factories with robots? Can we apply some of those ideas to, to hospitals and surgeries? Uh, and so yeah, that's that, that's kind of my my journey through through robotics. Great. Um, the same uh, person has a couple of follow up questions um, that, that might be kind of related. Um, she says, if I want to build an AUV, what else would I need to know besides electronics, programming, and mechatronics? I think you were mentioning something about control theory. Or... Sure. So I mean, they're all really important. Uh, components of any robotic system, and AUV in particular. So mechatronics is an interesting term. Uh, I think it originally came out of, uh, out of Japanese universities and I think by definition it's a fusion of mechatronic, uh, sorry, it is a fusion of mechanical engineering, electronics and electrical engineering and, and programming or computer science. So mechatronics kind of includes uh, electronics and programming. The thing that's probably missing from this is what's called control theory. Control theory is uh, a really important engineering discipline and it says let's say I've got a system, let's say it is a, an AUV and it's flying through the air and it wants to turn to the left, then how do I, what are the signals that I need to send to the actuators on that aircraft in order for it to turn to the left? So to turn to the left I probably want the aircraft to uh, apply some rudder so that it will uh, you roar, uh, move, uh, rotate towards the left, but it will probably also need to have some aileron control so that it banks, so that it will tip into the corner and then and then turn and go around. So control theory says, here's a machine and I've got a mathematical model that describes its dynamics and this is what I want the machine to do, then what should the control inputs be? 
and that's really what control theory is about. So let's say in the example of our AUV turning to the left, if I apply too little control, uh, then it's not going to turn perhaps as quickly as we like. It's not going to get where we want it to go. And if I uh, apply a very large control signal, it, it's possible that the machine will go unstable. Uh, and so a lot of control theory is about trying to understand uh, the stability bounds of of a machine and, uh, and and figuring out just the right amount of control signal to apply. Now that's a very, very simplistic uh, view of what control theory is. Uh, Basically, it's, it's a lot about writing differential equations to describe the dynamics of a machine and then analyzing those differential equations and coming up with a controller, which might be a mixture of what the machine's currently doing now, uh, what's the, the f current velocity or the acceleration of the machine, plus what I want it to do, folding all of those together into an equation to derive uh, the input to the machine. So control theory, I think, is the, is the missing piece here if you're wanting to build an AUV. Control theory is a huge discipline. There are very, very simple controllers called proportional controllers, proportional uh, derivative controllers, and we will touch on those uh, later in the later in the MOOC. Uh, if your background isn't in engineering, uh, particularly if you've never done a, a an engineering maths or engineering dynamics unit, you might struggle a little bit uh, with that one. If your background's purely computer science, uh, perhaps it'll be a bit challenging. Uh, but you know, I, I try to present it in the simplest possible way, and uh, maybe just you know listen to that lecture when it when it comes up. I can't remember which lecture it is. I think it's it's like ten or eleven, and maybe listen to it a, a, a few times. And uh, perhaps we have this, some discussion in the forum, and maybe just get the the core ideas of control theory across. Jason. <laughs> Yes. Uh, lastly, Maria says, uh, besides programming, what other areas of computer science could be developed in robotics? So programming, which I guess is just the the skill, the craft of uh, you know effectively turning in an abstract algorithm into into working code, uh, code that you know, is reliable, time efficient, memory efficient, uh, and uh, and so on, uh, is really really important in robotics. Also, the whole software engineering methodology is: if I write some code, how do I test the code? Uh, how do I manage code through its whole through its whole life cycle? That's really important, I think, when we talk about creating large software-controlled machines, which is essentially what a robot is. The other big area uh, of you know, endeavor within computer science is artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence is a very old. Uh, Subdiscipline of computer science has traditionally been about efficient search algorithms. Uh, if you consider a you know classical problem like chess or checkers, uh, I've got the current state of the of the game, and I want to search through all the possible ways forward of the game, and I want to do that very eff effectively and efficiently because there's combinatorial explosion in the number of possible ways the game can go forward. So a big area of AI is being concerned with efficient search. <laughs> There's also an area of neural networks, which are algorithms inspired somewhat by the connected uh, structure of, uh, of biological brains. So our brains consist of a number of very, very simple computing elements, neurons, which are massively interconnected with one another through uh, synapses and axons. And there's been interest in applying this to uh, many problems in computer science, particularly robotics uh, and computer vision. Uh, and that's been going on for many, many decades. But in the last five years, there's been uh, an area of development called deep learning or deep neural networks, which are neural networks on a massive scale. Uh, they've got many, many layers of neurons, uh, perhaps you know, between five and ten layers of neurons, and different types of neurons, uh, and different struct and much richer pardon me, structure of connection than existed in the early neural networks from a decade or more ago, and this is really exciting. People, uh, amazing results are being shown in recent times in terms of object recognition. You know, I can show a, a deep neural network, a picture of a cat or a dog. It doesn't matter what kind of cat or what kind of dog or where it's sitting or what the background is. It will say it's a cat or a dog. Uh, you know, you can use this to recognize numbers really reliably. So, you know, Google have been pushing this really hard. So, given that they've got Images of all the streets in most cities, and so they kept they see lots of uh, 
street numbers, you know, on all sorts of buildings and houses, there's a street number, but they're all in different kind of lettering, uh, different fonts, different colors. It's a really hard problem to get a computer to read the numbers on houses in general. And so, you know, Google have applied a very large computing resources plus these deep neural network techniques to uh, you know, do some really, really awesome uh, number reading. And you read some of their research papers, and they present some numbers there that I would struggle to recognize what the number is looking at the image. It's so small, it's so blurry, uh, there's not enough contrast, yet these, uh, these networks are able to do a really good job. So I think this is a really, really exciting area of computer science, and uh, it's being applied to uh, particularly to computer vision. It's also being applied now to, um, uh, to robotics, and I've got a couple of PhD students looking at these deep networks. How can we have a, an image from a camera going into a deep neural network which then sends commands directly to the robot arm? So just image into a big network and what comes out are control commands to the arm. And if we can teach it what it needs to do uh, through example in simulation, then uh, maybe we don't have to write specific algorithms to interpret the image, specific algorithms to control the arm. The robot would actually, the robot vision system would actually learn this. So, to, to my mind, it's probably one of the hottest areas in computer science at the moment. Uh, probably goes so far as to say it's a, it's perhaps a revolutionary change in the way we apply computing to real world problems. Jason. <laughs> Take my mic off there. <laughs> okay, next we have a we have one in from Gary Atherstone. He said, uh, "Hi Peter, I am wildly excited about your intro course, which I only came across by chance. I would like to hear your views on the future job prospects in robotics. I think we've had this one before. Um, yeah, we have. I am a graduate. <laughs> I am a graduate mech engineer, and I've been working for eight years. After the intro course, how should I get into robotics at a professional level? Are there any master's programs or other courses, internships?" Searching Seek, there are a few high-end robotic jobs, but then searching LinkedIn, I find a lot of really experienced people working in robotics. At 40 years old, with some real-world experience but no robotics knowledge, could I enter and compete with these young high flyers? <laughs> are there, and will there, in the near future, be a lot of decently paid, run-of-the-mill robotics jobs? I'm particularly interested in actual hands-on field work, specifically installing, optimizing robots, etc. I think it's going to vary from from country to country, and I'm not sure where Gary where Gary's from. I, I think that the robot industry is is embryonic. Uh, there are a number of of startups, and you know, characteristic of startups is probably run by a number of very energetic, uh, high flying people. Uh, to you to use Gary Gary's words. But I think a mature robotics company is going to need a whole range of skills. So it's going to need people who who understand who understand the the basic uh, the basic theory of robotics and can turn that into algorithms, turn that into code which runs on the computer, which is which is part of the robot. Uh, we're going to need software engineers who can make sure you know wrangle that big code base and make sure that it's manageable. We're going to need electronics and mechanical people. Uh, you need everyone from you know from uh, technicians, you know, field support people, field testing people, project management people. So I think like any uh, mature engineering endeavor, it's going to require people with a big range of, of skills uh, and experiences. So Gary's got some, he's, uh, he's got some maturity and some experience. I mean, that's going to be really valuable in any in any robotics enterprise. At the moment, to be honest, there aren't as many there aren't that many robotics companies around, but a number of big you know, mainstream companies are moving into into robotics. Uh, car companies, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, they've not been robotics companies. They know how to build automobiles, but they are be they will become robotics companies as they start to bring automation technology into their vehicles. So I think we'll see uh, robotics companies coming f in developing in two ways. So one is existing companies got a product and know that it needs to be automated, will look for robotic talent, people who know something about robotics, bring them in uh, into some, you know, some new project, some, some new unit and work on a robotic product. And you know, the other way is from smart people who know a lot about robotics, perhaps not so much about products uh, and engineering and the, and the world of business, uh, who come together because they've got a really bright idea uh, and and you know, as that company matures, it's going to need to have uh, a much broader range of skills. 
uh, to succeed on its own or else it gets bought out by uh, a bigger company. And we've seen this in Google, uh, over the, uh, particularly last year, Google went on a massive buying spree and they bought seven or eight uh, robotic companies, uh, varying levels of maturity, some were quite small startups, some were quite uh, long established. Uh, Boston Dynamics, for instance, been making some amazing legged robots, uh, Big Dog, Little Dog, Cheetah, uh, and they were bought by Google as well. So. I think there will be a lot more robotic businesses in the future. I think we're just starting to uh, robotics. If you draw a graph, uh, you get this right, is time in this direction. Robotics has been going sort of almost linearly, and I think we've really hit an inflection point, and it will it will go uh, grow really massively. I think if you ask yourself the question, uh, how how many robots and robot companies are in the world today? In five years' time, do you think that there will be uh, the same number? more than that number or less than that number. You know, it's not going to be less. Uh, robotics has got such profound advantages in terms of efficiency and cost reduction. You know, and I'd be very surprised if it remains static. So you know, I think the, uh, the only logical option is that this is going to go up. And uh, I've been in robotics for a long time. Uh, I've never been this optimistic about, about the field. Uh, I think it's really, really exciting time. So uh, I can't give you any tangible advice about where to go to to get a job. Uh, we can say, you know, keep uh, keep your uh, channels of, of of input open. You know, keep an eye out on what's happening uh, on all sorts of on news feeds, on the various social media channels. It might be that if, for instance, you're in Australia uh, and there's not as much action in Australia as I would like, to be honest, then you know, maybe you're going to have to to relocate to where the action is. So maybe it means uh, uh, packing up and going to to Europe or to to uh, to California or something like that. But it'd be really awesome to uh, have something happening in Australia. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got uh, one more, another question from uh, Ben Schmidt. Um, he says, hi, Peter. I bought my daughter the EV3 Mindstorm kit for her birthday in July, just before I found out about this course. And I'm keen to create something awesome with it. <laughs> what are some of the best things that you've seen <laughs> done with these robots? I'm after some great ideas. <laughs> All right, that's a pretty awesome birthday present to uh, to give to your your daughter, um, uh, and hopefully she gets she gets engaged and uh, and has fun with that. I have two daughters, and all manner of things before EV3 sets kits were invented, uh, slot car sets and train sets, and I probably had more fun with them than the daughters did. But good luck with uh, with your daughter and the EV3. What are the best things to do with this? I think. Uh, I just did a bit of trawling uh, on Google, on Google Images, and there are people have made some amazing things with their EV3 kits or with the predecessor NXT kits. So uh, probably worth having you know, Googling uh, NXT because the NXT kits have been around for a lot longer and got a lot of the same functionality, same kinds of sensors, same kinds of motors. Uh, so there's you know a fantastic range of things that people have done with with NXTs. As well as EV3, EV3 has just got, got a, a much superior computer and a better better programming environment. So absolutely, you could make robot arms, and that would be a challenge of something to do in this particular course. Perhaps not the most exciting thing in the world to do, but what we're going to get you to do is to build a robot with two with two joints, uh, put a pencil on the end of it, and get it to follow uh, a particular path across a uh, predefined sheet of paper. So that's what we're going to get you to do in this particular course. It's perhaps a, a minimum level of excitement, exciting things that you can do with an EV3. Uh, but as I say, go and, go and check out Google for inspiration. So you could definitely build robot arms. You could definitely build robot vehicles. So vehicles with wheels or with tracks uh, that can drive across the floor. You could build those with an EV3 kit. I don't think you could build a flying robot with an EV3 kit. Uh, I don't think the, uh, the, the, the motors would uh, turn a propeller quickly enough to get you any kind of lift, and EV3 bricks pretty, is pretty heavy. I know you can do underwater robots. So uh, an ex-colleague of mine, Ryan Smith, uh, who's now in, uh, in Colorado, uh, when he was at QT, he was doing some work with underwater robots built with NXT kits and motors. And the NXT brick, as long as you kept it dry, uh, it didn't like being underwater. But actually, the Lego motors didn't mind being underwater at all. So we had a, uh, a watertight enclosure which contained the NXT brick, uh, which he pre-programmed. And the wires came out 
uh, through, uh, from that container uh, through holes which he sealed up really nicely so the motors were in the water, uh, the NXT was, was dry and uh, he made some really nice uh, underwater robots. So he had uh, used some of those motors as thrusters, uh, as a propeller to go forward and some of the other motors uh, had other thrusters that allowed it to control whether it moved uh, up or down uh, or, or sideways with some yawing. So uh, that's a a pretty interesting thing to do. Uh, he's got some YouTube videos. His name's Ryan Smith. So uh, Google Ryan Smith underwater NXT, and you'll find uh, one of one of Ryan's videos. And let's see uh, a pretty interesting and weird thing to do with with an NXT kit. If you just got a brand new EV3 kit, I'd probably think a little bit uh, carefully before I was to put it underwater. Uh, I've done some work in underwater robotics, and yeah, the big challenge is keeping water out. Water is, uh, is amazing stuff. Uh, if it's the smallest gap or crevice, uh, water will get in, and it does terrible things to electronics. I've seen a lot of very uh, fried electronics from uh, improperly sealed underwater vehicles. So yeah, be be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, that just prompted me. I thought it might be a good time to plug. If you happen to be in the Brisbane area um, this weekend, we have a robot-flavored event, uh, Robotronica. Um, uh, I just posted a link to it in the discussion form. Have you uh, been involved in that, I imagine, in the past? Uh, in, obviously, not in, in lieu of you not being here this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a fantastic event. We ran uh, we ran it uh, two years ago, so it was a one day festival of all things robotics. Um, I gave it gave a talk about um, my view of robotics, and we had uh, a whole lot of sort of now robots on display, and we had three D printing, and uh, there was a robot art uh, exhibit uh, or installation, which was which was pretty impressive. We had some of our uh, agricultural robots on dis on display. It was something like. You know, nearly 20,000 people came to the campus on that particular day. It was fantastic. And in the evening, we had a a display by a, an Austrian group, and uh, they uh, they have a display they call Spaxels, and it basically is 40 quad rotors, and each quad rotor carries a very bright uh, LED, which can be red, green, or blue. So they fly them in the sky and form particular patterns uh, of. In, they fly them in the night sky and they form particular geometric uh, patterns or configurations in the sky uh, with with the lights. So they make these amazing animations of all these uh, just these red, green, or blue lights moving slowly through the sky and you know making particular pictures or or symbols uh, and slowly changes. So fantastic technology uh, that these guys have put together. So if you're interested in that, uh, again, Google Spaxels, S-P-A-X-E-L-S. -E and uh, they've done major displays in all sorts of cities uh, around the world. Uh, so if you know of a display somewhere near you, it's worth going to see. Uh, if you can't get, go and see them, have a look at some of their, their YouTube vids. It's pretty impressive. So that was kind of the finale of the Robotronica uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't think they're going to be at, at this Robotronica, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be a good day out nonetheless. Yeah, they do have some uh, EV3 uh, Mindstorm workshops, uh, which I got my son in. And uh, right. I believe they're doing a, a final performance this year with the Deep Blue Orchestra out of QT and with some uh, uh, robotics, uh, applause robots, and some uh, yeah guest robots appearing in the orchestra. So that should be kind of quite fun. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, next up, we have a question from uh, Demetrius Cass. He says, what is the current trend in providing robots with emotional intelligence? I've seen a robot that gets angry when it can't find a way out of a room, for example, when it's stuck at some obstacle. How difficult is it to provide a robot with emotions and where it is used and what, the future, what is the future in the field? Do you consider it dangerous for humans? Okay, it's a, it's a really good question and it's something that I think I've changed my mind about over time. When I first started to hear about uh, robots that uh, were able to exhibit emotion, uh, to be frank, I thought it was pretty kooky stuff. Uh, people were building robots that uh, had um, effectively deformable faces, so they had eyebrows that they could raise and they had various other, uh, uh, they could change the shape of the mouth and, and whatever. So they could make a, a number of, of different kinds of facial expressions. But when you think about it, human beings are uh, really, really adept at reading the facial expressions of, of another human being. So when we're communicating with a person, uh, we certainly use words to communicate 
uh, complex ideas, but we also communicate our emotional state through the uh, through the configuration of of the features on our face, and quite unconsciously, uh, it was parts of our brain that that are that are tuned uh, to recognise the. Uh, these emotional uh, expressions from another human, and it, uh, I think, is actually quite a, a powerful cue to us when we're interacting with another human being. So if I'm talking to somebody and they look confused, they don't have to say, "I'm Peter, I'm confused." I can tell by looking at them that they're confused, and I will uh, perhaps change the way that that uh, I communicate with them. I'll try and phrase my ideas more clearly, uh, perhaps more slowly. If I'm talking with a person and they look angry, then I'm going to have a different conversation uh, with that person than if they didn't look angry. So we are really uh, very, very sensitive in almost an unconscious way with the emotional state of another human being. So the thought is that this would be a useful thing to have on a robot. So consider that a robot is, uh, that you're communicating with a robot and it doesn't understand what it is that you're saying. The robot could say, Peter, I don't understand what you're saying. Could you tell it to me again? And you could express all of that in words. Uh, it would be kind of tedious to have a conversation like that with a robot. But if the robot uh, adopted a facial expression which indicated that it doesn't understand what you're saying, then you would unconsciously rephrase, repitch what it is you're saying to the robot in order that it would understand you. And if it had a sort of happy expression, then you were nodding its head, then you think, okay, the robot understands what it is that I'm saying. You know, this conversation is going to go well. The robot's going to understand what I want. So by having these nonverbal cues, I think it's going to actually make it much, much easier for a robot and a human to, to, to interact and, and have a conversation. So Dimitri's question is about the robot getting angry, and if the robot's in a room and it comes up to an obstacle, there's really not much point in the robot being angry. Uh, there's just as much, just as little point as there is in me coming up to an obstacle and getting angry. But if the obstacle is another human being, then you know the robot could you know adopt perhaps a serious expression. Uh, and if the person didn't get out of its way, then after a while, then perhaps the robot should adopt an angry face uh, in order that you know, the person knows that that I'm annoying this robot, that uh, the robot wants to do something and I'm frustrating and it's getting a bit cranky, uh, and then perhaps the person would move out of the way. The thing I find with, with people in mobile robots, and we noticed this at the Robotronic exhibition a couple of years ago, is you've got a robot moving through, moving through the room, and the first thing anyone wants to do, particularly a young boy, is to stand in front of the robot and see what it does. Uh, there's just something in human nature that they just think that this is a dumb machine and they figure all sorts of ways to torment it. Uh, perhaps they're trying to calibrate how intelligent it is, but for a, for a lot of people, young boys in particular, just go and stand in front of the robot and see and see what happens. Now, if the thing was perhaps more human-like, it perhaps had a face and it had expressions, my hunch is that people would be less inclined to, to mess with it uh, because I think that they would automatically identify uh, with it and assign some human characteristics to it. And human beings are fantastic at doing that. You know, we can read the facial expressions of a dog and know whether the you know dog is happy or sad or angry. And if we put a face on a robot, I think we'll do the same thing. We would treat them with more respect and more kindness, treat them uh, a bit more humanely. So uh, I think there's an advantage in putting a face on a robot. If the face can represent expressions, I think it's a way that would allow the robot to give some cues to, to humans that would be very useful. The final part of Dimitri's question is, do, we con do I consider this to be dangerous for humans? I don't consider it to be dangerous. I actually think it's a, a way that we can have more effective interactions with robots. And uh, my, my personal belief is that there will be more robots in our lives uh, in the future. And if we can communicate with them better, I actually think that that's advantageous. So perhaps what we need to clarify here is it isn't that the robot is angry. Uh, the robot has got some code on board that says, I want to go from A to B, and there's an obstacle in the way, and the obstacle's not moving, and I'm pretty sure the obstacle's a human being. How do I make the human being uh, get out of my way? Well, it's to an adopt an angry face. So don't think of it as the robot being angry. It's the robot reasoning about, how do I interact with a human being that's frustrating me? Uh, I know that human beings uh, can respond to an expression that looks like anger, 
uh, and I'll ramp that up slowly and see if that helps me get out of my out of my situation. So uh, important to to keep in mind, it's not an angry robot. It's an ordinary robot with an angry face, and that's quite a different thing. All, all while adhering to Asimov's three laws of robotics, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't say an angry face. All right, that, yeah, that's, that's, right. A, that's an allowed thing. Um, our, our next question up is actually from our very first uh, live uh, video guest, uh, Cameron Whiting, one of your students. So I, I'll let him take it away. And <laughs> how are you doing there, Cameron? Uh, make sure your mic's working here. Uh, you need to take yourself off mute. There right. we go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, fantastic. So I'm on a, I'm right now I'm on a 10 megabyte LAN because I'm currently moving out of the storm. But here's my question. Whereabouts are you, Cameron? I'm I'm over in Laramie, Wyoming, and I'm actually studying with Jeff Boone at the Evolving AI Laboratory. So mm -hmm. it's at the University of Wyoming, and he actually knows who you are. And he also knows um, Juxi Lettner, and Juxi Lettner knows who he is. <laughs> Juxi Lettner is one of, the, one of the postdocs in my lab, so uh, he, he, he uh, did some work on the iCub, iCub humanoid uh, iCub. robot. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome and thanks for um, for being our inaugural uh, student student guest in the in the event. Yeah, definitely. Pleasure to be here. Um, my first question is um the the TAs from the vision class that was in June um mm -hmm. are they the same ones in general in robotics? Um, are they the same, the same postdocs or do you have two different camps? Uh, so it is the basically it's the same. There's a, a bit of background noise there, and he's shouting or odd, odd, odd noises. Uh, maybe you, Cameron, just uh, maybe pop back on on mute when you're um, when you, you're not talking. So the it's the same team being responsible for production of both MOOCs, the uh, robotics MOOC and the. Uh, Robotic Vision MOOC and Robotic Vision MOOC will run again in October. And yeah, we've used the same TA group for for both. Uh, a because they're uh, local, uh, so they're uh, sort of ex ex students of mine at undergraduate level, and now they're working uh, at postgrad level uh, as either the PhD students or uh, or research assistants within the lab. So uh, they're local. Uh, I've worked with them, some of them for quite a, quite a long time as undergrad students. And uh, yeah, they've got some experience with with MOOCs. Now they've got sort of two MOOCs under their belt, uh, uh, and this is the this is their third one. So yeah, pretty much the the, the same team. So we've got quite a bit of experience now in uh, in, in running MOOCs and, and running forums. So uh, yeah, basically we want all the talent and experience that we can get. Definitely. Um, I think I can sum up the other question as um. Like you talked, you talked about the book changing. Um, yep. And about rewriting it after the five-year cycle. Um, how? No, actually, the other one that I had was um, how has the, like the Australian Center for Robotic Vision was started in 2012 or so? Um, yeah. How did that? How did that dovetail into um, the robotics program, and how did you dovetail into? Because I think there was two other faculty that already were in. The robotics program, or were related to the robotics program. Um, okay, so I'll take that as two questions: one about the book, and one about the the center for center for robotic vision. The as I said right at the beginning, there is there were a few areas that uh, I, I think were that were left out of the book uh, at the time. It was because I ran out of I ran out of energy. It's, it was a pretty draining process writing the writing the book. And uh, yeah, I kind of had to publish a deadline, and the book was already ridiculously thick. Uh, sad thing is, after the rewrite, it's going to be even thicker. Uh, and the, I think the limiting factor is physically what the binding can can accommodate. Um, in terms of what's going to be new in there, uh, I think the mobile robotics section in the book is probably uh, less detailed than than it should be. So I'm going to cover different kinds of uh, ground. Uh, Ground mobile robots, so uh, differential steering and uh, omnidirectional bases using mechanum wheels. Uh, they're going to be covered uh, in there. There's going to be a lot more in the uh, localize in the localization and SLAM area. Going to cover post graph optimization. Uh, 
and there, which I think is important, uh, laser scan matching I'm going to cover. In the uh, introductory part of the book, there's probably going to be a, perhaps a little bit more formal. Uh, I'm not a particularly mathematical person by nature, and the first part of the book on the fundamentals was probably not as formal as, uh, as, it could, as it could have been or perhaps should have been. So it's going to be a little more formal and I'm going to cover uh, some techniques like matrix exponentials and twists and have a little bit of a foray into uh, Lie groups and Lie algebras. This is a pretty scary area called algebraic topology. It is important in robotics and the reason that I haven't put it into date was, was A, I didn't understand it properly myself. And I think if I'm going to try and express something in a book, I need to understand it pretty well myself so that I can explain it in the simplest possible way. And for me, that's the essential challenge in writing a book is how can I, there's, it's easy to write stuff. I, I can read a bunch of papers and other textbooks and I could write a blurb on Lie groups. But if I want to make the simplest possible explanation of Lie groups, then I need to understand it pretty well myself. I need to think about it for a long time and then figure a way to present it in a similar sort of style and, 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 and type of treatment as I've done in, in the rest of the book, which seems to, to resonate with a lot of readers. Uh, so that's probably the sort of the main areas that will change in, in the first part parts of the book, a little more formalism, uh, a few more mathematical tools, uh, more thorough treatment of ground mobile robots. Uh, I'm not going to do any more on flying robots. I'm not going to cover underwater robots at all. The vision part of the book is already pretty, pretty comprehensive. Uh, there are a few techniques in there I, I might like to mention. Uh, light field cameras, I want to have a bit of an introduction to, and a technique called bundle adjustment which is given I've got a number of cameras uh, or a camera moving through the world, how do I figure out the three-dimensional structure of the world and where the cameras were and I want to uh, cover that technique as well. I think that was critically missing. Uh, and then there's just a whole lot of general rewrites throughout the, throughout the whole book. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's it for sort of a rough plan for, for the book redevelopment. As for this thing called the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision, this is a, a centre funded by the Australian Research Council. Uh, it would be, in the United States, equivalent would be the NSF. Uh, in Canada, it would be, uh, I'm not sure what their program would be in Canada, I'm sorry. Uh, in the UK, it would be the EPSRC. So they fund uh, major research concentrations for seven years. So uh, we got something like 27 total 27 million Australian dollars uh, over seven years to try and push this field of robotic vision. Those mentioned earlier, robotics is a field that's booming, there are lots of robots out there, but the main sensing modality for robots is laser scanners and uh, things like uh, SICK laser scanners or Velodyne laser scanners. So these are quite expensive opto-mechanical devices, opto-electromechanical devices that throw out laser pulses and measure the 3D structure of the world. And that's great. People have shown fantastic achievements using this kind of sensing modality. Google cars have used them. Uh, lots of the other automotive automation projects use this kind of sensing. But we're really intrigued by the idea of could you just do this job of driving a robot, driving a car, using only cameras? We know that we can do it. I can drive my car quite successfully uh, using just the information that comes from my two eyes. So why can't I drive a car using information that comes from just two cameras? We know the cameras are really cheap. Uh, you know, cameras in this, you know, the, the quantity that someone like Apple buys them and puts them in phones, uh, cameras only cost a few bucks each. So, and the cameras uh, that we can buy today They've got similar kind of resolution to uh, to our eyes, and I talk about this in the robotic vision MOOC uh, to to motivate the, the problem of robotic vision. So, cameras aren't the issue. The issue really is in the algorithms that we use to process the data that comes from those cameras. Uh, that's that's the, the current bottleneck. So, do we use you know traditional computer vision techniques? Do we use deep neural networks to process the information? These are some of the research problems uh, that we're looking at uh, within our center. So the, the centre was, uh, was funded in uh, late 2012. Uh, we started to build the centre last year. Uh, we recruited uh, about 16 postdoctoral fellows uh, from around the world. 
our centre is based at four different universities in Australia. So Queensland University of Technology, uh, my home base, well, we're the headquarters, and I'm the director of the centre. The University of Adelaide, Australian National University, Monash University. We've each got kind of different strengths. Uh, QT has got a kind of quite a strong uh, field robotic flavour. Uh, but also does a lot of computer vision. The people in Adelaide have gotten a lot of work on semantic vision. So that's the problem of, I take a picture of the world, uh, how do I label the pixels in that as to the kind of object that they belong to? So how do I say that this pixel's a floor, and this pixel's sky, this pixel's a car, and this pixel's a person? Uh, they're interested in, amongst other things, they're particularly interested in and particularly good at that problem. The Australian National University guys uh, got real strength uh, in control, particularly control based on visual information a field called visual surveying, which is an area that I've played in a bit. Uh, my colleague Rob Marnie, uh, that's, that's his thing. And the guys at Monash are uh, interested in many, many things, uh, but in particular uh, algorithms uh, and, and architectures. How do we get these computer vision algorithms to run really fast and efficiently on some of the amazing new computing gear that, that's coming coming out. So you have mobile computing platforms, GPUs, and other sorts of uh, bespoke computing architectures which people are inventing. How do we get our algorithms to work on those? And importantly, I think there's an energy dimension in the computing we need to do for, for robots. Uh, we can throw a Google cluster at it, uh, to, to run uh, the algorithm to solve the problem. You know, it needs a hydroelectric power station to, to power the Google cluster. You know, that's nice, but I can't put that on a robot. So I need really energy efficient algorithms that can do the job for the minimum number of millijoules. And I think this is an, an interesting way to think about computer vision problems. Uh, Cameron, you got any, some more specific uh, questions on that? Um, I, I mostly just have a just have a comment to make. The the vision class was really actually surprisingly it, it dovetailed really well into um, into their research that they were doing with Hyperneat um, because it was Good. it was very parallel. It was very like working on task operations and opening and closing pixels, right? It it definitely helped with that actually. So that Good. was a really good introduction. So. Thank you. Uh, the the center has got a number of a number of goals. So you know we're funded by the Australian federal government, and you know we need to do a number of different things. You know, one, we need to do good research and publish papers. Uh, you know, B, uh, we need to engage with industry. You know, try and get our ideas and technologies commercialized. Uh, we need to engage with the general public. You know, let them know about what the technology can do. You know, don't be fearful of it. You know, robots are uh, you're going to make our lives in the future. Uh, uh, more more productive and, and, and lovely. Uh, another one is in training, so we need uh, you know we should be training uh, PhD students uh, and training postdoctoral fellows, but also uh, undergraduate education is another thing that the centre has uh, committed to do. So these MOOCs are actually part of the the centre's commitment to uh, broader education in the area of robotics and computer vision. So if you consider that the that this idea of that robots will become much more pervasive in the future, that we many uh, more robotic products uh, and devices in our lives, and that perhaps many of them will use vision because vision is a really low cost uh, way of sensing the world, and we know it's an adequate way of sensing the world. We know we can do it, so therefore a robot with cameras should be able to do it as well. Uh, if this all comes to pass, then we're going to need a lot of people who are skilled in the, the fundamentals of robotics and in the fundamentals of computer vision and the combination which I call robotic vision, we're going to need a lot of people who know this stuff, who can work for the companies that are producing the products uh, or you know go on to create their own companies to develop these products. So I think we need to find a way to train lots of people in these new areas of technology and the MOOC is part of that. Uh, it's got the advantage that it can reach uh, all around the world, uh, perhaps reach people who don't have the opportunity to go to a university in their own country to learn this stuff. Uh, they can at least uh, learn some of the fundamentals uh, from the MOOC, decide that they like it, and then figure out what they're going to do with their life after that. So, uh, w another, so the centre has got a commitment to provide uh, education, as in the form of the MOOCs, but I also think the world is going to need people who know this stuff and the MOOC is uh, one way of reaching a lot of people and trying to pass that knowledge on. 
That's great. Thank, thanks for your questions, Cameron. Hey, uh, Peter, we're uh, reaching about the end of our time, but we do yep. have about a dozen or so questions that have come up during the discussion. How would you like yep. to do a rapid fire a few or answer the rest in the forum? Or, or uh, let's, try, let's try some rapid fire. <laughs> okay, all right. We've got um, uh, Andre Koval has asked, can all software that drives robotics be called AI? AI is is a word that I a term that I've always struggled with. Uh, I wouldn't call all software that drives robotics AI. There is some software that's pretty ordinary, you know, that makes a wheel turn at a particular speed. I wouldn't call that artificial intelligence. But perhaps some of the uh, robots got low-level software that does things like move motors and stuff. I wouldn't call that AI. At the higher level, you've got software that understands the world and makes plans, and perhaps you could call that artificial intelligence. <clears throat> okay, and uh, Wendell Hope is asked, uh, what is the most common CPU plus OS platform used in robotics, and how does that vary based on intended robot use? Okay, I'd probably divide the robot use into into, into two. Uh, I think you've got hobby class robots, uh, and that's probably going to be done with pardon me, Arduinos or Raspberry Pis connected to uh, hobby servo motors, Dynamixels, uh, and the like. And you've got perhaps more professional robots uh, in labs, uh, which are going to be based on uh, Linux systems, uh, running a thing called a Robot Operating System ROS, which is not really an operating system. It's a robotic middleware. It gives you a lot of tools you need and a way to configure those tools to build a custom robot. You need quite a bit of skill to use ROS, but uh, most university labs are going to be using ROS. An increasing number of companies are using ROS in their products. So the Baxter robot from Rethink Robotics uh, is ROS inside. Mm. Um, and from uh, Lakshmi P, we have, is there any possibility of robots being used for baby care or babysitting? I'm thinking uh, <laughs> robots tank or, <laughs> or the new humans. Yep series we've had recently? <laughs> Listen, it's, it's a really good question. It's a deep question. I mean, at a technical level, yes. Uh, I'm sure we could create a robot that would look after a baby and make sure that it was safe. Uh, I think the bigger question is, is this good for the psychological health of the baby? Is this something that we would want to do? So I think, yes, we could do it. The question is, do we want to do it? We're already considering this now for looking after elderly people. So there's enough, a lot of people think it's okay to have a robot look after an elderly person, but those same people don't seem to think it's okay to look after a young person or a baby. Or uh, So I think this is something that, as a society, we need to think about, is this a good thing? Maybe it's an ethical question, not a technological question. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, Carlos Manuel Lara Avendano says, First of all, thanks, Peter, for your dedication and contributions to the field of robotics. My question is around where to dedicate efforts on learning around robotics, if it is more important to study around the hardware or if it is more important to study around the programming and the AI algorithms. Uh, my belief is it's the programming and the AI algorithms. Uh, there's enough pretty good robot hardware out there. Uh, my view is you just buy the hardware. Uh, what we don't know, the big problem is still how do we use process the information that comes from sensors like a camera into an understanding of the world, into a plan, into an action. Uh, that's where robotics is weakest and that's where I think you should focus your study. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Muhammad Alzarani says, can I visit the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision? And I'm a robotics trainer in the talented centre, Saudi Arabia. Absolutely, you can visit. Uh, send me an email and uh, we, can, we can tee up a time to, to come and visit. Great. Um, next is Rodrigo Calderano of Barbacovi. says, cheers from Brazil. What is your opinion about platforms like Arduino, Raspberry, and others for starters in this robotic world? Fantastic for starters in, in, the, in the robotic world. Uh, it means that you can actually get your hands dirty with a, uh, with a robot, build something, and, and get some experience. So I think it's invaluable. Uh, you can basically build a robotics lab uh, in, your, in your house, in your bedroom, uh, in your dorm. Uh, and I think it's the experience uh, is really important because it motivates why robotics is hard and what are the areas that you should study. So absolutely, get, get some of this technology, build a robot, have a play, figure out what's hard, and then work out uh, which of all those hard problems you're interested in and pursue it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next we have uh, Mohammed Salah El-Din says, I am coming from electrical engineering background. What should I know about mechanical design to be a good roboticist? 
Look, it depends on the particular sort of roboticist that you want to be. There are some uh, some labs and groups that specialize a lot in the mechanics uh, of robots. You can see the groups like uh, Boston Dynamics who built those awesome leg legged robots. Uh, there you need a lot of mechanical design. But as I said earlier, I think the big challenges in robotics are around software. So if you come from an electrical engineering background, as I do, uh, I think the challenge would be to learn software and artificial intelligence, perhaps, uh, rather than mechanical engineering. If you really want to learn mechanical engineering, that's really your interest, uh, then there are a lot of, then there are, you know, th some significant problems to be solved, but it's not really an area that I know a lot about. Mm, yeah, fair enough. Um, next, we have Alexander Gazliesh says, Hi, Peter. Thanks to you and your team for the awesome course. I'd like to know your opinion on the state of robotics in the maker movement and open source hardware software communities. Where are the most exciting developments and directions that you think? Look, the maker community is an, is an amazing thing. Uh, I, I think I've... I'm a, not really very engaged in the maker movement. I guess I, I kind of just look at it from the from the side. I think low cost 3D printing, the fact that you can uh, have a 3D printer in your house, I think is fantastic. Looking at some of the uh, open software CAD packages that are around now, uh, and I've been playing with some of these recently. Uh, you know, fantastic CAD capability, which I could connect to a 3D printer and build something. Uh, there's a, a colleague of mine in Germany who's been doing some amazing things where you can actually if you like, write some simple code to describe parametrically the sort of robot that you want and it will actually, instead of you having to do the detailed CAD, you specify the sort of machine that you want and it designs the components for you uh, with slots where you just put them up, just put, drop the motors in and drop the electronics in and uh, and all comes together. So basically, you can write some lines of code, and instead of having a program that runs, it actually synthesizes a machine that you can do a little bit more assembly on, and it will actually move and do something. So I think these are, are wonderful achievements. And I think the whole business of taking an idea that you have about a machine to the machine in a very simple and effective way is the big challenge. Once upon a time, we programmed computers using something called assembly language, and it was a very, very low-level way. You had to understand a lot about the computer in order to write your code. Uh, it was very hard to write code, and then we developed high-level languages and compilers, and now we can you know, write a few lines in Python or Java, and uh, you know it gets turned into code. I don't have to understand how the computer works at all, and I think the same thing's going to happen with mechanical design. I can write some lines of code, maybe draw some diagrams in a, uh, in a graphical interface, and the robot is automatically designed uh, and and built for me. I think that's uh, an important frontier. This is not quite rapid fire answers. I'm trying. <laughs> that's all right. We've got actually many more questions that came up in the forum. So a great turnout this time. That we should probably uh, make a wrap of that. And uh, I'm sure that between you and the TAs, we can answer some of those uh, remaining questions on the discussion forum. Absolutely. And, uh, and, uh, we'll do a, a second a second event maybe maybe in a couple of weeks. And uh, certainly if more people uh, want to appear uh, live within the event, uh, as Cameron has done, that would be fantastic. Cameron, thanks for uh, patiently sitting there through the, uh, through the whole event. Much appreciated. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a wrap. That's great, yeah. And next up, we should be having a meet with the TA, so you actually get to get face-to-face -face with them and ask them some questions directly. So, um, all right. Thanks very much for tuning in from uh, from Oxford there, Peter. No problem. See you next time. All right. All right. Thanks, Jason. Bye. Cheers. Bye.